This session is called Through the Lens, and we have a very special speaker for the session, Mr. Palani Mohan, award-winning international photographer, and Indian-born, then raised in Australia, and now living in Hong Kong. This session is brought to you by Sister Nivedita University, an initiative by Techno India Group. We'll be joined in a short while by Professor Santanu Ray, Director, Student Enrichment and Mentor, Department of Management and Commerce, Sister Nivedita University. Professor Santanu Ray is a reputed researcher and educator for more than 20 years. After qualifying as a chartered accountant with flying colors, he started his career at Tata Steel Tube Division and was with them for more than 10 years. Subsequently, he worked with BK Billa Group of Companies, Zydus Cadilla, and Avantis Pharma. Prof Professor Ray got attracted to academics and got an opportunity to lead ICFAI Business School as director for 10 years. Subsequently, he worked as campus director, NH NSHM uh, Knowledge Campus, and as director, NSHM Business School. Professor Ray has also been associated with Bengal Institute of Business Studies and BP Podar Institute of Management and Technology as chief mentor. Professor Ray has also functioned as Chairman, Board of Studies, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad University of Technology. Professor Ray is an author and researcher. He has authored four books on valuation, strategy, and creativity. He has more than 20 publications and case studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome Professor Shantanu Ray onto the dais. A very warm welcome to you, sir. And I request Professor Ray to kindly do the honors of introducing the session and the inspirational speaker, Mr. Palani Mohan, sir. Thank you, and, uh, and a very good evening to all of you. Uh, yesterday, this time, we had the diva, Himaji. Uh, so it's really a daunting task. But before I go into it, I would like to uh, say a few words about our university, which is the newest and arguably the most talked about university in this part of the country. This university has been born out of a passion, passion of our chief minister, honorable chief minister, respected Srimati Mamta Banerjee, who told our chancellor that 2018 being the 150th year of the great sister Nivedita, they were together uh, at the Sister Nibedita's house in London. At, Why don't you start a university after her name? And uh, Shottam Rai Choudhury, being a man of vision, is a visionary. And uh, so he decided uh, that he's going to have it. So we are still uh, absolute baby. But there are certain unique things. Uh, you might be wondering, there are universities and universities. What is, what is the differentiation that we bring? First of all, first of all, this is perhaps the only university where the entire academics is on the Moodle learning system. An IQAC, internal quality assurance uh, uh, cell, which I am functioning as the director, already started. We, we've started to bring in and the, the North American Ivy League colleges quality standards and try, trying to keep them as a benchmark. And our center of excellence is not technology-based. It is aspiration-based. It is, a, it is, a, it is a, a center of excellence where students from BCom to BTech to a master's in biotechnology to MBA, everybody will be part of the center of excellence. This is what we bring to the table. And uh, we bring also a lot of research, a wonderful faculty. Some, our dean is drawn from IIT Kharagpur and from similar places. So this is Sister Nivedita University. We are, of course, trying to follow the uh, the. The, the learnings of Sister Nivedita, which, which is basically social. So we are, we are very conscious about our social responsibilities and CSR. With these words, let me get back to the session. 
Uh, yes, so it, this was a daunting task. So when I was, when I started searching for this gentleman, Palani Mohan, I was amazed. I was amazed that at just 51, he could achieve so much, so very much. And uh, not only in photography, he's authored seven books, six books, and the seventh one, he is, he's currently working on the seventh one. And uh, you'd be amazed if I tell you that he authored the first iPhone book on iPhone 3S in 3, 3 and 3S way back in 2011. Now, uh, I would request uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, yes, please dim the lights and please show the Indian, Indian photos. Thank you. Can I? I don't need to introduce him. His work speaks for itself. Palani, please, please. Friends, please put your hand together for this extremely brilliant, not only a photographer, an author, and if I may add, with, with a tinge of philosophy, philosopher in him also. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. We can take a seat. It's the first time I've ever been com uh, on the same sentence compared to Hema, the famous m movie star. So um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Where do you want me to sit? not working, but my voice is good enough. Hello? It's working. Hello? Yes, it's working. Uh, Palani, mm, you're born in Chennai, raised in Australia, and now you live in Hong Kong. So how did, what is the, tra how did this transition happen, if you can tell us? <laughs> well, luckily for you, we only have 20 minutes, so I'll make it brief. Um, so, I think my journey, uh, I was born in Madras in, in, uh, in South India, and I was born into quite a well-known Tamil movie family, where everyone in my family either wanted to get into the movies or they wanted to be a politician. And my dad was the only sensible one who decided this was a bad idea. So, he, uh, we migrated to Australia, and I went to school in Australia, I was brought up in Australia, and when I was... Um, 17 years old at high school, I enter a photographic competition which was run by the local newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald. It was an Australia-wide competition where uh, thousands of children all across Australia entered this competition. And to my great shock, 
my very great shock, um, I ended up winning it. So I, I get a job with the Sydney Morning Herald, I got a camera, $500 cash price. So just after I turned 18, I started work at the Sydney Morning Herald newspapers, and that's where really my photographic career um, started. It was, I was extremely fortunate and lucky that I basically fell into something that I loved doing. Uh, I was talking to someone today, just recently, and we spoke about when I was growing up as a kid, I never ever thought that you could make a career out of something that you love doing. Um, so, uh, so photography is something uh, that I've, I've been taking photos ever since I was a kid. It's something I love doing. It is the air that I breathe. And to think that I, could get a, I can get paid $174.50 per week, that's what I got paid when I first started, it was something quite fortunate. And, um, and I've been doing it for 30-something years now. So. Great. Um, who who inspired you? Who inspired you to this? Well, you know, there have been many, many um, uh, photographers, and just not photographers, you know, painters. I mean, when I was a young kid, and, I, and it's so wonderful to see young uh, st students here tonight with us, and I think, you know, if you really uh, want to get into the arts, or photography, or, or paintings, or drawings, you need to look at a whole bunch of different types of artistic forms. And when I was a 15-year-old, you know, 16-year-old, I used to go to the art gallery, and I used to look at masters, the classic great painters of our time, you know, Rembrandt and so forth. And, and Rembrandt used light better than anyone I've ever seen, any photographer that I've ever seen used light. He, 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 he did portraits next to window lights, so the softness of the light and the play of light. So um, not only photographers like Cartier-Bresson or, you know, um, um, or Steve McCurry's work is really nice, and, um, and so some of the painters were, were very influential in my, in my, um, uh, my eyes. Yeah, uh, okay, you could, have, uh, you could have gone for fashion photography, <laughs> uh, but you didn't go that, you, you, you didn't go that way, you went to uh, nature, wildlife. Well, I started off as in a newspaper, so I did, um, Actually, my very first, my second day on my job, I, I had to assist um, as a page three photographer. I, mean, I don't know whether you know, in the old days, they, they used to have dreadful pictures of women on page three, and, and I had to go, as a young 18-year-old kid, hold a reflection shield to photograph this woman. So, that was, that's, so I've done everything from a bit of fashion, a lot of news, and I was a sports photographer for almost 20 years. Um, so I covered every possible... Um, I did the Ashes tour, and I did all the golf, and all the tennis, and all the Olympic games, and so forth. So, um, and I've done a lot of news, a lot of hard news. Um, I've I've done a lot of like famine and natural disasters, and so forth. So, my I've had a long and varied career, and at the moment, I've I'm focusing because I think I'm. You've told my age. I was gonna I was gonna lie and say I was 49, but you already know I'm 51. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm very interested in, um, um, as you'll see from the work I'm going to be showing you, I'm very interested in, in, in the environment and in nature and what we as human beings are doing to it and how we can play a, perhaps a better role in it. So, um, yes, I've done a bit of everything. Yes. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, once Shoti uh, Ray, you know, the uh, who, is a, who is an icon all over India. Yes. I had the privilege of knowing him. He told me in Bengali, Nesha jokhun pisha hai, tokhun ar sheta bhalo lagena. That means when your passion become, becomes your profession, it loses its charm. Do you agree? I do. I think, especially if you're in the arts, you know, um, I, you'll never be rich doing what I do, but um, I have a rich life. And at the end of the day, um, that's what I have two beautiful children, and that's what I tell them. That, um, you know, being my wife's a journalist and I'm a photographer, and we have a comfortable life, but we live in Hong Kong, and my kids wish that I was a banker. <laughs> so, um, so I think having passion and, and doing something that you love doing is such an important thing because I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love it and for over 30 years. Um, and, um, you know, I, I regard my job as a privilege, 
um, and, uh, and every day you know, meeting, ev photographing everyone from you know, the kings and queens to the uh, bricklayers. Um, and I think it's a great privilege and I, and I take that with me every time I go and photograph, especially remote communities, which I do a lot of work with. Tell us uh, some of uh, your moments of great success and highs, and again, some of your lows. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, so great successes are when I think, when I finish a project, I've done uh, you know, a whole bunch of books, and I think the success is when, when you see your book and, and, and you look, you're going through it one afternoon at 10 o'clock at night by yourself, and, you, and you're proud of what you've achieved. I think, um, and, I, and I, those quieter moments are the ones that I, that I take most out of. And I've got so many disappointments, um, so many great photographs that I've missed. Um, especially the next, the images I'm going to be showing to you in Mongolia. Um, I, you know, so many images I miss because of, of the cold and the wind and the cameras falling apart. So there are many images that I uh, look back on, uh, which I haven't got. So I think it's, uh, I'm never satisfied with, um, you know, with the end product. I never, which, you know, which is one of my great sort of faults, I think. Um, but um, in some ways, it's, it's a good way to be. It's so refreshing, Palani, because in all these, uh, in, in this discussion, uh, throughout the day, we had uh, artificial intelligence, we had cyber, we had cyber crimes, we had everything. We have, we have technology. And you bring in the human aspect. Uh, and uh, do you also use a lot of technology? We understand, I would like to put a question slightly differently, that robots are going to take over. Yeah. How a robot will take over? Can a robot take over your job? Um, no, it can't. I mean, I think it's a, very, it's a really, uh, really great question because, you know, I use my iPhone and I, I, I use the, the simplest of cameras. I've got a camera at home which is made out of wood and a plastic lens and it takes exquisite photographs, exquisite photographs. And I've got the Hasselblads, which are, you know, 15, 20,000 US dollars a camera. So yes, of course we need technology. Of course we need technology, and we need the software to process it nowadays. But I think the most important thing in photography and in painting is, is light, and it's about content. Content, 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 right? You know, it's about light, and light is not technology. Light is available to the poorest person, to, to, to the richest. Um, and content is all out there. Calcutta is such a great place for content. So yes. Of course, we need technology, but it's, um, I would say if I had to number it, I would, I would put technology right down the bottom. I think it's about uh, looking and feeling and um, being a, uh, you know, we briefly, touching, touching. <laughs> and um, we briefly spoke about this before. Uh, everyone here has an iPhone, and um, uh, one of the mag uh, uh, magazines that I was reading on the, on the uh, flight over here uh, I, I read an article that said that in 2019, there's going to be 1.2 trillion photographs being taken on the iPhone. Trillion photographs. And out of, I mean, I don't know how they got the figure, but I believe it. And out of that, 80% of images that people take on their iPhone, they do not see. I believe that also. Uh, so it's this real, I think we all do it. You know, we all take hundreds of, we go to the Taj Mahal and we take not two photographs of the Taj Mahal, but we feel that we ought to take 200 or 300 photos of the Taj Mahal. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure why that is, because, because perhaps because it's free, but if we slow down and, and look at it and look at light and look at the viewfinder and really think about why we're taking it, we might end up taking two or three photographs, but they're the ones that we're going to remember um, and the ones that perhaps we might even do something outrageous like do a print. Remember those days where we actually printed the photographs, you know? Um, I mean, how many people here would print something that you've took today? I would say zero. And I think that's a great shame. And I think by slowing down and looking at the world through the viewfinder of your camera, and you don't even have to um, take the photograph, and you, know, just, it, you get great joy just looking through the viewfinder. Um, um, have I drifted away from your question there? Because um... <laughs> you, have not. you have not. You have, so... not. You have not. I think you nicely answered my question. And uh, okay, uh, with all the tension around us, 
the world is passing through uh, a turmoil all over. Uh, in this, uh, are you drawn to take pictures of, for instance, terrorism? Would you like to go to Afghanistan? Would you uh, to, 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 to look at terrorism from close quarters? Uh, because it, it involves a lot of risk and a kind of a daredevil kind of an attitude. Yeah. Uh, would you like to do that? Well, um, I have done that. I've done a, a lot of that when I was, uh, when I was much younger, working, at, uh, working for that newspaper. I've been to Afghanistan, and I've been into dreadfully dangerous situations, and um, I, I have to say that I, I didn't like it. It wasn't me. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have surrounded with great friends who are the best conflict photographers in the world and the best news cameramen in the world. Um, they take incredible risks to take um, and to, to take exquisite photographs and, and video. It's something that I've done. It's something um, that I'm, 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 I'm not really that interested anymore in the conflict stuff. I'm more interested in what conflict perhaps does, does to humans and to the environment. Mm. Um, so, um, uh, yeah. You have, a, uh, you have a book, Children of a Lesser God, which, is, which speaks of the rickshawalas of uh, Calcutta. It was, which year was that? I was going through it. Yeah. And yeah, but it's not, not here with you, but uh, it, it, it's a very moving tale of a rickshaw puller uh, from Bihar and uh, their life, uh, the life of those rickshaw, rickshaw pullers in Calcutta a few years, 2012 or was it? Was yeah, it was, it was actually a, um, a, a set of uh, portraits that I did in Calcutta actually of, um, of, of uh, this stylized studio portraits I did in Calcutta. Uh, which, um, which I think was 2010. It's all a bit of a blur. Yes. See, when you're 51, it's all a blur, right? <laughs> so, so I think it was 2010 or 2011. There were, there were a set of pictures in Calcutta. So I've been coming back to Calcutta. Uh, it's an it's a incredibly visual. I was this morning. I got up at six in the morning and I went to the flower markets and and it's such a um, and I didn't take a photograph. I took my wife there, who's with me here now. But um, I didn't take a single photograph. I just went there to look and smell and and just be inspired. Um, so, um, and you know, he takes his wife of all places to Howrah Station <laughs> to get the pulse. This is, this is a photographer. This is a person with sensitivity. Uh, he, he, would, he would prefer to take his wife of all places. He would prefer to take his, his wife in, uh, of all places to the Howrah Station. Uh, that is the sensitivity of Palani Mohan. Palani, why did you choose Howrah Station? Oh, because she wanted to go there. But but it, you know it's such a wonderful place because it's it's got great light. All state all railway stations, especially in winter, in India have great light, and um, and it's such a special joy moment when you just you don't have to do anything. You just have to find a nice spot and you just have to look at light, and um, it's it's like a it's like a clean breath of air that goes through your body and refreshes you, and, and, you're, and you're inspired to do other things, perhaps not even in India, but you, it just inspires you. It's like a, it's oxygen for your body. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, um, that's something very important to me. See, uh, Palani, this, place, this is a place uh, of poets, of painters, and also of photographers, and, uh, but there's only one fear that uh, how is this, uh, this, this uh, fine arts as a profession or this, this kind of, this, this human uh, touch um, uh, uh, things. Uh, there are a whole lot of my students who are here. Yes. Uh, and for them, uh, how is this as a profession? Do you, where, do you, where do you see this, this profession of photography going in 20 years from now, for instance? Look, I'm, uh, there's a lot of, um, it's, you know, I think I used the term before that you know, you'll never be rich, but you'll have a rich life. And I, and I repeat that again. Um, and I think, um, I think it is a profession. When I first started at the Herald, there was, a, there was an incredible Australian journalist called Tony Stevens. He was a legendary journalist. And I'd never met him before, but I saw him the first day and I recognized him by his photo byline. And I summoned the courage and I went and introduced myself to Tony and I said, my name is Pliny Mohan and I just wanted to say it was a great pleasure to meet you. And I, and I asked him a really well, stupid question. I said, 
how do I become a great photographer? And I realized how ridiculously stupid that was as soon as it came out of my mouth. And I'll never forget what Tony said to me. He stood up and, he put, and he's this wonderful five foot five, he had a white beard, he looked like Santa Claus. Um, he put his hands on his shoulders and he said, you need to be curious and you need to think of every day as a privilege. And you have to work bloody hard for the rest of your life. And he walked away. And I think I've never forgotten that. Um, and I think if you want to make it in this industry, if you want to make it in anything, in any industry, I, 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 would, I would say, especially in the arts, I think you need to be very passionate, you need to believe in it, and you need to find your own path. Um, by all means, look at other people's work, which is such an important thing to do. Look at paintings and look at art and look at photo books and read and, and be open yourself to the world like that, but you need to find your own path and, and, and look at things your way. And if you do that, um, you know, I, I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful occupation and wonderful life. And, um, and uh, I think when they, when they say, when the machines are calling, you, know, you don't think about the wealth that you have taken. You know, you think about you know, all the wonderful things you've seen. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I, uh, you know, I'm, I think you should do it if you want to. Great. Uh, I will now uh, come to your uh, last book. When I was researching uh, on him, I was simply amazed uh, with this book of his, uh, Hunting with the Eagle in the Altai Mountains. This, this is in, this is in, uh, uh, where is it? Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia, Mongolia. My, my faint recollection of Mongolia is that uh, my geography teacher, and uh, I was in St. Xavier's and it was very strict. My geography teacher asked me what is the capital of Mongolia? So I couldn't answer. Then he asked me what is the capital of Kazakhstan? Neither could I answer. And then I was asked to kneel down uh, 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 out of the class. And then he told me Ulan Butter. So I wrote Ulan, B-U-T-T-E-R, Butter. But this gentleman, how he went there, everything you, 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 you listen, listen from, from him, it is really, it, will, it, it gave goosebumps to me, really, honestly, I'm telling you. So I will, I will ask, I will now go and sit there, and I would like, to, like you to narrate okay. your most uh, spectacular, I think, something that I consider you, consider to be the most uh, spectacular achievement in your life. Well, I'm in big, under a lot of pressure right now, aren't I? It better be good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll give it a go. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Please, forward. Sorry, say. No, fraud. Forward. Hmm? Oh, that's forward. Okay. So, once again, thank you very much for coming. So, the sto every story um, has a beginning. And the stories of big blue open skies, wild horses, eagles, the Altai Mountains, and Mongolia, and myself started a very long, a long time ago. Uh, when I was 18 years old. I briefly mentioned to you before that when I, I got a job with the Sydney Morning Herald, um, and two or three days after I turned 18, I started work at the Sydney Morning Herald, which was, those days, one of the finest newspapers in the world, right up there with the New York Times and everything else. Um, it was in this beautiful old building in the middle of Sydney, and in the fifth floor of that building, next to the library, they had a room, where they used to keep copies of all the newspapers, everything from the New York Times to the New Zealand Herald. And every day, if I could, I would go down to the fifth floor and I would go through the newspapers, especially the foreign section of the newspapers. So for a young, green, 18-year-old kid growing up in Sydney, it was a window to the outside world for me. I was fascinated with everything in those newspapers. One day, 
when I was going through one of those newspapers, it was a British broadsheet, I think, I came across a photograph, this incredible photograph of a man standing on top of a snow-covered mountain, beautiful looking, he had a fox fur coat on, and he had a fox fur hat on, and he had a golden eagle in his arms. It was in black and white, it was grainy, and it had an extended caption. It said it was taken in the Altai Mountains in Mongolia. Now, I remember, a bit like that image you see on the screen, right there. Now, I remember thinking, where on earth is the, are the Altai Mountains? Mongolia I've heard of, but where are the Altai Mountains, and how can men tame eagles? I stood there like I am now, looking at it in this incredibly beautiful photograph, and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be fantastic to go there? I looked at it for about 10 seconds, I turned the page, moved on to the next newspaper, and my life carried on, basically. Every now and then, when Mongolia turned up, I would think about the eagle hunters of Mongolia, whether they're still around, but I just lived my life and went off to do other things. So I'd like to fast forward, all of you, to 2012, when I was living in Hong Kong with my family, and I've just returned from a trip to India, and I was late at night, and I was going through some emails, and I received a junk email from Mongolian Airlines, of all people, informing me that they've just commenced daily flights between Hong Kong and Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia. So that was my cue. You know, I'd waited long enough. So I make a couple of phone calls the next morning. Uh, it was December. I knew it was going to be cold, but I had no idea how cold it was going to be. Um, you know, I get a visa, and with very little planning, I take off. I get on a plane, and I head towards Ulaanbaatar. So, so Hong Kong is basically down there somewhere, you know where it is, and I fly to Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia. So the land of Chinggis Khan is the coldest and the most polluted capital in the world during the winter months. It's because there are so many people moving into the capital, and they're in the winter, it's minus 40 degrees, they're burning the cheapest, nastiest, horrible coal you can possibly imagine, and it's a bit like, Ulaanbaatar is a bit like Delhi, it's very flat, so in winter, everything just stays down. So I land in Ulaanbaatar, not really knowing why I'm there, to be very honest, and I get on a plane and I fly to the very northwest part of Mongolia, right where Kazakhstan, China, Russia, and Mongolia meet. Now, Kazakhstan and Mongolia don't actually meet, but it's close enough. Middle of nowhere. So I land in a place called Ulgi, and I realize that it's 10 degrees colder in Ulgi than what it was in Mongolia, So it was like in Ulaanbaatar. So it was like minus 40 degrees when I land. I spend a few days there, and because I have once again, I had no real idea why I was there. I just wanted to go and see these eagle hunters. I had no idea how many there were, whether they were actually really there. Was it fake? I've heard of these um, uh, eagle festivals that are happening all over the place, but I didn't really know it was real. So it was quite refreshing for me to just to go somewhere without really knowing what I was going to find. A couple of days later, I find out that there are between 50 to 60 of these true eagle hunters still alive today. And I just thought, and each year, some of them perish. Uh, they perish from the cold, and they perish from old age. And I just thought, there's my story, and only I can do it. Um, I just didn't want to photograph one man with his eagle. I, I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could photograph all of them Totally crazy idea. I wanted to go and live with them, I wanted to meet all of them, and I wanted to photograph not only the eagles and the men, but I wanted to photograph their environment. So I began this crazy, crazy five-year project when 
I went numerous times from Hong Kong all the way to Ulgi. And I'd like to uh, show you a slideshow that I've put together of what exactly I found when I got there. And then I'll come back and I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you something more about eagles and, and, uh, and the landscape. So I think uh, if we can dim the lights and um, w with a bit of luck, the slideshow is going to work. Back to you soon.
so that's me. <laughs> so this is probably a very good time to tell you something very, very important, that I was born in Madras, right? I'm not built for the cold whatsoever. Right? I hate the cold. When in Hong Kong, it gets down to about, if anyone's been in Hong Kong, maximum minus one, and you know, I'm rugged up. So this was by far the most difficult thing I had to do as a photographer. Not because I was cold and miserable and I thought my fingers were going to fall off and I was in pain constantly. It's because my, I couldn't figure out how to keep the batteries of my camera warm. And all of a sudden, it became the most important thing in my life. I forgot my children's birthdays back home because I was trying to figure out how I, I could keep the batteries warm. And, over, and, I would, and I would bring all kinds of things, and I would you know, bring in um, a, you know, thermal cloth that I would wrap my batteries in. That didn't work. And I would try everything. And I figured that the only way to keep your batteries warm was to get some gaffer tape and strap them in various hot parts of your body. So underneath your armpits, uh, well, anywhere warm, I'll just leave it at that, you know. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'll just try and paint a picture. So I'm on an ice shelf uh, with, you know, we've been walking on, or uh, riding and on walking for, for all day, and I come across this incredibly beautiful place to do my portrait. So I would, I would set up the, uh, the reflectors, and I would make this guy stand there with his eagle, it's this incredible backdrop. And then I would reach down and I would yank the batteries out of my armpits, stick it in my camera. And with a bit of luck, I used to get sometimes 30 seconds, sometimes 45 seconds. Now, someone smarter than me out there can perhaps tell me why sometimes I get 30 seconds, sometimes I get two minutes, but it, so I missed a lot of images. And, and that really was very depressing. I briefly spoke about uh, you know, things I don't like about it, because at night, when I used to go to sleep, in the girls, I used to think about all those photographs that I missed, because I saw it, but I couldn't take it. Um, and also, my hands were incredibly cold, and I couldn't work. Um, I don't know whether any of you have been in minus 40 degrees, but it's quite, um, it's quite, a, quite a thing. So, um, so this is roughly... I probably have got on about six or seven layers of clothes there inside, and, and that's, that's, how I, that's how I worked. Now, this is a golden eagle. Now, let me tell you something about these amazing birds. Um, in that part of the world, there are no tall trees. So all the eagles that build their nest high up in the rock faces. And this is where the hunters go to get a young pup. They're looking for an eaglet or an eagle pup about four weeks old. There's no great signs to it. Old enough so they would seen and tasted a fresh kill, but not too old. It can't learn to live with humans. It's incredibly important. So this is what happens. They climb up into their rock faces, and they snatch the eaglet from the nest, and they take it home. And once they get home, uh, they hand feed the bird, one person, hand feed birds about four to five times a day. And something truly remarkable starts to happen when, when this process takes place. This is when, as the eagle hunters used to tell me, this is when they fall in love with each other. The bond between man and bird starts to take hold. And I soon realized that that's what my project in Mongolia should be all about. Yes, great portraits and landscapes and light. Yes, absolutely. But at the end of the day, if I can come up with the feeling of the bond between bird and man, I think I would have done the job. And that's what I tried to do with each one of my pictures, images, for the next five years. So a golden eagle can live up to 30 years. And interestingly, after keeping the birds for about 15 years, about 15 years, the hunters release the birds back into the wild. They give the birds back to nature because they've stolen the birds from their, from their mothers. Only, they only use 
the female eagles to hunt because the female eagles are much bigger and they're a lot more aggressive than their males. So they only use female eagles. So when the bird is about 15 years old, during the summer months, this is what happens. They ride off with the eagle a long way, maybe 100 kilometers or more, and they give the bird fresh meat, as much as a bird can eat, and in the cover of night, they sing songs, they say their final goodbyes, they let the birds go, they hide behind ro rocks, and they ride back home. Now, as you can imagine, this is an incredibly moving time for the eagle hunters. Um, I mean, they've been living with these eagles for 15 years. The wives are always complaining that the men talk about the eagles way more than they talk about them. Um, so giving up an eagle is an incredibly moving moment for them. And they cry as sometimes when they ride back home. And amazingly, I've heard stories more than a few times for this to be true. Um, days, weeks, or even months later, these eagles somehow find the men and they return back to them. And with a heavy heart, they have to do the whole thing all over again. So these are some of I often like looking at photographs in silence. I think it's... Um, so, this is a portrait of Orak Khan and his beautiful great-granddaughter Nazgul. Now, Orak Khan is the oldest, the greatest of all the eagle hunters in the land. He's the Donald Bradman of eagle hunting in that part of the world. He's a tall man, he's very handsome, he's got broad shoulders, um, and his hands are like sandpaper. So, and he's gone blind in one eye, and his earring was almost gone. His wife had died 10 years before I photographed this, and he misses her dearly. He's had over 10 eagles in his life, He's an incredible man. So every time I went and I returned back to Mongolia, I would always make a point of going and finding Orak Khan and spending as much time as I could with him. Everything that I know about eagles, the changing environment, the wolves, the foxes, um, he told me. Uh, we would, um, he thought I was like, completely eccentric many of the times. So you always used to say, you know, what, what are you doing once again? You left your family all the way and you come back to the cold to ask me more of the same questions. Just be quiet, eat meat to keep warm. And I'm mainly a vegetarian, so he was horrified when I told him that I don't eat meat. And I, and I can't really ride a horse either. So, um, um, so yes, he just thought I wasn't much of a man. So, I'd like to read um, something. So, I did a book, as, as you know, and there's a whole chapter on Orak Khan and his views of the world. And um, I'd like to read a little bit from that, if I may. The golden eagle is like no other bird. These are his words, by the way. The golden eagle is like no other bird. They want to be with you. They love you, and they love to kill for you. When the time comes to let them go, it's the hardest thing a man can ever do. Nowadays, the young generation aren't interested, and there are many things to keep them busy, like earning money and listening to music. They all seem to like going to the capital, we should train our children to keep this tradition alive because this is who we are. To the young, I would say, the eagle is a holy bird. Treat them as your child. Love them and respect them. And if you do this, 
they will give everything back to you. Our traditions have not totally disappeared, but we are the last of the true eagle hunters. So the last time I saw Ora Khan, he's passed away sadly, two years ago he died. He told me a story of a tall man like me who had a camera as big as mine who came to visit him a long time ago. So this man had photographed Ora Khan on top of a mountain with his eagle a very long time ago. Now, sometimes when I'm looking out of windows of planes and trains and thinking about life, I sometimes like to think, what if that photograph that I first saw when I was 18 years old in that newspaper office in Sydney, in black and white, what if that was Ora Khan? I like to think so, but I guess I'll never know. So I've been going back and forth to Mongolia for many years now. And I'd like to talk to you about my next project on Mongolia, which the working title of the book is Listening to Silence, which I, I love that term. And one of the eagle hunters told me that, gave me that, um, that phrase when I asked him what he did for days on end in the cold on top of a mountain with his horse and his eagle and his yaks. What, what do they think? What did he think about? And he said, and what do you do? I said to him, you know, and he said, we listen to the wind, which, which I love that, especially the busy lives that we all live. I live in Hong Kong. It's quite a chaotic place. Um, it's about taking time and just listening what's, to what's happening around you. So the next project on Mongolia, which is, which is going to be a book project, is really about the changing environment. It's about quietness. It's about finding, living in the moment, finding stillness and calm. And I'd like to show you, these are pictures that have never been shown before. So this image was taken right on the Russian-Siberian-Mongolian border of this fabulous 120-kilometer long lake called Lake Kuskal. And this is in winter, and the whole lake freezes over. And it's the only place in the world that they use horses in sleds to, uh, to, to go across. So Russia is right down, you, the horizon is Russia. So these horses go towards Russia, they bring back vodka and you name it, back into Mongolia. So I spent a few days living on that lake. And this is what I found on that lake. So these are ice bubbles. So if you can imagine a big frozen lake and there is great water underneath and the water is trying to get up. So these waters find these little small holes and they try to sneak up. And as they're sneaking up, because it's minus 30 degrees outside, they freeze. And every morning, I'm the only one for 500 kilometers, the driver and myself. I'm, I'm, I've got a car that we drive around the lake with. And this is what I find every morning when I wake up, of these incredible art formations. And they, when, when it warms up a bit, it changes, and they go, the water goes back in. And the next morning, I find this. It's quite beautiful. So this is, so if you can imagine, that is the lake, and it's frozen ice. And the snowflakes, those little things you see, are, it snowed in the morning. And because the snowflakes are warmer than the frozen lake, when the snow hits the frozen lake, it explodes. And it's like white, white roses. So you kind of see this all over the place. Um, and it's really quite something to witness.
Now, I've purposely shortened my talk because the most important thing for me is to um, try and think what you think because I learn so much from your questions. So um, I'd like to open it up, if that's okay, uh, for some questions. And hopefully one or two of you will have some. Yes. yes. Hello, I would like to ask you two questions. When you were in Mongolia, what language were you conversing with? Was it Russian? Yes. Um, well, I, um, I, well, th these are Kazakhs, as I, as I said before. So you've got Mongols and you've got Kazakhs. Um, they're very different people. Um, they, pray to, they pray to different gods. They speak different languages. They look very different. The only thing that is similar between them is they both live this nomadic life. Okay. So uh, the eagle hunting only takes place in <coughs> Kazakhstan which, uh, and towards the northwest part of Mongolia. Okay. So they speak Kazakh. So I had a, um, I had a team of a driver, um, a cook, and a translator, and a car, and a, and a Russian jeep. And uh, I used the same people over and over again over the years, and many strange things used to happen all the time. And then I found out that uh, the translator and, and the driver were married, and now the translator and the cook were going out with each other. <laughs> and many, 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 many strange things that took place. It all, I went, ah, okay, you know, now I get it. You know. So to answer your question, um, I used them to translate. So, uh, so they would speak in Kazakh, and then I would get it in English. Okay. And my second question to you is that apart from uh, these eagles being trained as hunters, were they also used as messengers? No. Um, they were... Um, they, I mean, there are, there are paintings of you know, Chinggis Khan and Obli Khan with golden eagles. They've been using golden eagles to hunt okay. um, as prestige, like the Arabs use their falcons for a very, very long time. So um, they used the, the eagles to hunt foxes and wolves. Okay. And they almost all the time they use it during the winter months because the fur is at its best, uh, the meat is at its best, um, and it's traditional. And they can see the footprints of the fox running off um, better because it's, there is snow. And during the summer months also, um, they, uh, they've got other things like getting their yaks healthy and milking and um, so they've got lots of addicts. So it only, it only takes place during the winter months. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Hi Palani. So uh, I'm a bit of a photographer myself. Must congratulate you on this stunning thing. I have seen the series on NG where I think they also uh, hunt for uh, mountain goats and clouded leopard in uh, Mongolia. I think there's also a series on that. I've seen that series somewhere. So I've got two questions for you. One question is, why did you choose black and white as a medium, number one? Number two, I see a lot of portraits that you have taken, okay? But uh, I didn't see too much of use of white angle. Uh, why, I mean? Okay, um, why black and white? Um, I mean, I'm very comfortable and I like shooting color and black and white, but Mongolia was a no-brainer for me. It had to be in black and white because you look at them and they, you, they, and they could be living 200 years ago. Nothing much has changed there, especially when you get out into the, into the boondocks. Um, and, there, and, and to be honest, there isn't that much color. They've got dark skin. Uh, the eagles are, are, are dark brown. Uh, they, there is a timeless feel to the landscape and the people and the eagles and their story. And I think black and white really um, uh, complements that, that timeless feel to it. Um, so, and also, to be very, very honest, except for some of the carpets, there isn't that much color. I mean, blue skies, which turn beautiful, in black and white, blue skies look terrific because they, they go the shade of gray, which you can control. Uh, and I think the second question is, why don't I use wide-angle lenses? Um, I thought there were a couple of wide-angle lenses there, but... There were a couple, there were five I saw, but... Yeah, uh, I but, thought... uh, but I think when you're shooting portraits, uh, it's very difficult to use a wide-angle lens, except people when you're doing um, landscape photography, whereas you're, you know, I've got a lot of uh, pictures, images of an ice, and someone standing there with mountains in the background. 
Um, but I like to use standard lenses. Um, if that, I don't want to get too technical uh, on you guys, but uh, I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable using standard lenses because it makes it, uh, to me, look more real. I mean, I, 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 well, I'm looking at you, and I'm looking at you through a standard lens. Uh, because most of the time your eye works like that. You know, I'm looking at you with, with a 35 mil lens, you know, and I, I'm not, I can't really see unless if I open it up. So most of the time you're using a standard lens to see. Uh, just one more question. How does the light progress throughout the day? So does the light is very bright in the morning, it's like here, or uh, it's more or less a little darkish throughout the day? Well, um, it varies. If, you know, I was recently in Mongolia last month and we had... I was there for two weeks, and we had blue day every, every day. And I personally, I think there's no such thing as bad light. It's light is what God gives you, and you work with it, basically, right? And it's pointless complaining about light. Um, but, I, but I love bad light, meaning I love rain. I love, um, my last book is in, in Hong Kong. It's about, it's about wind and water in Hong Kong. So every time there was a typhoon, I would get very excited. Uh, I, I love mist. This morning when I was out um, at the railway station in Calcutta, it was beautiful uh, because it was mist and pollution mixed together. <laughs> so it was beautiful light. So um, I think the best time to take images is when it's before the rains or before after the rains. It's, it's what people would regard as bad light. A beautiful blue day, I don't get too excited about that. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Okay. So some questions need to be digital also in nature. So moving from the film era to the digital era, do you feel the value <coughs> photographers used to attach to the value to, of click, shutter click, has got diluted moving from film to digital era? Because you can click and you can preview. Yes. Okay. So that's number one. And a related one is with everybody carrying a camera in their pocket now, do you feel that has led to a lot of clutter? Or do you think it has done a whole lot of good to the cause of photography? Yeah. Um, I, I do a lot of workshops. And, uh, and one, of the, one of my favorite things to do is uh, have a group of people, and we just say we meet in a park. And I would say, OK, all of us, we have one hour in this park, and you have three frames, and that's it. You can't take any more than three photographs. Sometimes it's one photograph. You've got one hour, you've got one photograph. And that's answers a lot of your question. And I think it's so easy now with digital because it, you know, space is so, it's free basically, you know, it's so cheap. And you feel like you want to take a lot of photographs. When you take a lot of photographs, you're not really, you're covering bases, you know, you're not thinking about why and how you want to take photographs. But when you slow down and when you look and when you think, and, and it's like walking into a dark room. It takes your eyes a while to get used to it. And I think um, by looking through a viewfinder without taking photographs for the first 10, 15 minutes, I think your end product is always going to be better. So um, I think I, 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 someone, one of the students was going to ask a question, and I think it would be, be really cool if you, if you guys can ask a question. Good evening, sir. Hello. Uh, Please don't call me sir. Call me Polani. Okay. <laughs> My name is Aritra Basuroy, and I'm from Sister Nevedita University. Uh, sir, I would ask, like to ask you one thing. Um, what was your perspective while clicking these pictures, and what were the experiences that you went through? Just a brief of that, if you will. Thank you, sir. Well, I did it for a very long time. I did it for you know, over five years. So um, I had lots of experiences as such, you know. Um, and, the, and the project evolved, and as, as I told you, when I first got to Ulgi, I, had, I was clueless. I didn't know what I was going to find. I was just curious. It's what Tony Stevens, that wonderful man at that newspaper, told me when I was your age, you know. He said, be curious. And, and I was curious, and I think that is the best, you know, looking back, you know, I'm 51 years old, and, and I think if you lose that element of being curious, you, you've lost everything, really, you know, I think. So, um, so, so the project evolved, and the more I learned, the more time I spent with Orak Khan, the more I learned about, the, about the, the, the eagle hunters and the environment, that my journey 
um, changed. So um, is that going to answer your question? Um, yes, sir, it's fine. I just wanted to ask you one last thing. Sure, um, sure. While clicking these pictures, you mostly, uh, I felt that you mostly focused on the nature, I think, the, uh, the scenes and the lifestyle of the people. Uh, so what was your main perspective while clicking these pictures? What were you mainly looking for? Sure. It's a, it's a really great question. Um, hopefully you'll agree with me, but if you look at the portraits and then if you look at the landscape, I like to think that you can see a bit of both. You can, you can see the face in the landscape and the landscape in their faces. The harshness of the landscape is translated into their faces. And I, and I started to see that. So it, it, this project really became more of a, a landscape and a portrait book, because I can see, you know, the, the, these these old eagle hunters. It's the la the land is everything for them. Without their land, they've got nothing. So um, I think trying to get a balance between the land and the and the and 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 the faces, the, the portraits. I think th that is that is something that that I really concentrated on and and. You know, I spoke about it briefly before, and it's about the bond between man and bird. That was a really important thing. And I felt that if I didn't do it, no one was going to do it. And um, there, are, there are less than 40 of these guys left now in the world. You know, and, and, um, and no one, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this, I'm not at all saying that, wow, how great I am, I did it. But I felt that, you know, a guy from... A, was born in Madras, was the guy who was going to photograph the last of the Kazakhs. Why? I don't know. But I'm glad I... Uh, there were many times when it was cold and miserable and I missed my family and things, everything was going wrong. I just wanted to run away and, and hide, you know. But um, I'm glad I stuck through it. Thank you for sharing your experiences. I've, I've, I've been told, you know, that... Sorry? I've been told I can take one student question. I can do, I'll talk to you afterwards. Yes, sir. Sir, I'm Tanmaydas from Sister Nivedi University. And uh, my question is that uh, how to judge the right moment to click an artistic picture like yours? A, that, is a, that is the million dollar question. What a great question to end. How do you judge it? You know, there is a voice that comes from deep within you that tells you that you should do it. It's this, um, you just know it. And the way to know it is years of experience, looking at paintings, looking at drawings, looking at art, looking at other great photo books, um, training your mind and your soul, if I can get a bit soppy, to see it. And because and when I see it, I mean, when I see something beautiful, it's just, it just comes out, it's just natural. And you, you, I think you'll know it when you see something beautiful. But you've got to train yourself to, to see it. You've got it right there with you. Inside every one of us, there is, you know, the eye is there. But I think the way I do it is the more you train yourself, the more, more, more images that you see, the more paintings that you see, the more you think about what you like, I think it comes naturally to you. So there's no magic bullet. Um, I think you just need to train your eyes and your mind and your soul to, um, um, to see it. How much patience do we need? How much patience do we need? <laughs> you need, you know, you need a lot of patience. Uh, do you remember that, you know, what Tony Stevens said to me and, 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 and it's bloody lot, lot of work for the rest of your life. And I think I don't think it's just for photographer, I think any industry, I think you need to work hard and you need to be patient and yes, I think you need a lot. So I think I've been told to stop. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalani Mohan, sir. Thank you so much. We are totally in awe of what you had just said. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you have told us so much more through your passionate narrative. Thank you very much, sir. We request you to remain on stage for just a couple of more minutes. I will request Mr. Professor Shantanu Roy to kindly come forward, please. Professor Shantanu Ray, may I request you to kindly come forward? And I will request Mr. K.K. Mohapatra, Organizing Secretary and Head Infocom ABB Private Limited, to kindly come forward to present mementos to Mr. Palani Mohan and 
to Professor Shantanu Ray. Thank you very much for being here with us and sharing your stories. <laughs> Sir, please come to the middle. They'd like to, a good picture. Thank you once again.